Thank you so much for joining us today um, to talk with Darren Davidson. She is our Sustainable Landscape State Specialist with Colorado State University Extension. She is also a longtime CONITS member and a member of our board of directors. We appreciate her so much and her knowledge is basically unparalleled in the state. So we, we are so lucky this evening and thank you so much, Darren. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks. I appreciate the introduction um, and have fun at the rest of the conference. I, it sounds like a great one. So hi, everybody. Like Maggie said, my name is Darren Davidson and I'm with CSU Extension. Um, I so I have a background in horticulture. I have a degree in horticulture from CSU and then I have a master's of landscape architecture from um, University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, and what I really love is combining my plant knowledge with the design uh, because so often, um, at least in commercial settings, so often landscape architects don't really have a whole lot of plant training. Um, so being able to really bring those together and design appropriately for um, for our, our uh, environment and with the, the correct plants is so key. So that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, and then just to talk about my native plant, um, how I got into native plant horticulture, um, I worked for several years at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center down in Austin, Texas, which is a native plant botanic garden. That was before I went to graduate school. And um, that is where my deep love of native plants and gardening with native plants um, really uh, was solidified, I guess I will say. But um, so anyway, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this. This is one of my favorite talks to give. I will say I can hear some background noise. So if everybody would just check to make sure that you're muted, um, then we won't hear you know, pets barking and dinner being eaten or whatever it is, you know, now that we can do these online uh, classes, we can also multitask. So just make sure your microphones are muted and I'll go ahead and get started. And like Maggie said, um, we go ahead and type your questions in the chat and I have a few built in opportunities to address those. But um, so what we're gonna cover, you know, I'm also gonna turn off my video. I feel like sometimes that's a little distracting. Okay, so what we're gonna cover is, um, we're gonna talk about what is a native plant. You all are members of the Colorado Native Plant Society, so you probably know, but I think it's good to remind ourselves of that, um, of the various definitions. And then we're gonna dive into design. Um, what is it? Where did it come from? How long is, has you know official landscape design been around? We're gonna talk about the elements and principles of design and then how to apply those to native gardens. So, um, you know, the design principles are going to be the same no matter what your plant palette is. So the first half of the talk is really gonna be um, kind of design, landscape design 101. And then we'll talk about um, how, the, how native plants get incorporated into that. Um, and, like I said, we will have time for some Q&A and about half-ish way through, we'll actually take about a 10 minute break for people who might need to stand up, stretch your legs, um, look at something besides a computer screen for a minute. So what is a native plant? Um, we have a couple of different definitions. Uh, one is a species, that a species that occur naturally in a particular region, state, ecosystem, and habitat without direct or indirect human actions. And then we have species that have been placed, have been in place since the advent of European colonists in North America. So that, that um, human component. So we know that Native Americans moved plants around um, and that's not so much what we're talking about. We're talking about people that uh, came from elsewhere, brought, brought plants from wherever they came from, um, and uh, started sort of changing the ecology of a place. So it's important to note that landscapes and those are garden areas are part of larger ecoregions. Um, and if ecoregion is not a term you're familiar with, um, an ecoregion is uh, denoted by, it's an area with general similarities. So um, whether it's climatic or soils, you can see the map on the left, the green one, has uh, one scale of ecoregions. 
um, you can see, even if you can't read the, um, the words, the sort of bright green on the southeast is the south called Southwestern Tablelands. Above that is the High Plains, that band of green down the middle, the Southern Rockies, et cetera. Then the, the uh, map on the right is drilling down uh, a little to a more fine grain, and it's getting really more detailed in those ecoregions. So then we're looking at things like sagebrush parks, salt desert shrub basin, Laramie basin. And so we can look at it at these different scales. Um, generally speaking, when we're, you know, if you're botanizing, you might be looking at one uh, region, uh, one um, level. But if you're gardening and you're trying to source native plants, we're going to be looking at um, something more similar to the left uh, map. And again, there's there's wiggle room there. You know, some people say, well, it's you know, we're the we're looking at political boundaries when we're talking about, about states. Um, and so, you know, where do you draw that line? But generally speaking, we're looking at these ecoregions. So why go native? Again, I know that I'm talking to a group that thoroughly already understands this. Um, but one thing that I have found interesting is I've definitely encountered people who are absolute native plant enthusiasts. They love going on hikes. They love botanizing. They, they totally understand the ecology and all that, but never really thought about bringing that into their own yards and into their own landscapes. It was sort of like, you know, I live in town. This is what I have in town. And I go elsewhere to, um, to experience and enjoy the native plants. But what I think is so exciting is that we can bring those native plants into our urban spaces and increase biodiversity, increase habitat, and do all these other great things. So when we're gardening with natives, we're working with and for nature, and this is gonna use fewer resources. So it's estimated that up to 60% of municipal fresh water um, used by households in the West is used on the landscape. So that's drinking water, cooking, cleaning, bathing, that sort of thing is put outside on the landscape. Um, the majority of that is put onto turf, um, but still, landscape plants too, annuals, perennials, trees. Native plants still use water, of course, all plants need some water, but they're potentially going to use yet less, and then you can design to use less potable water, and that's going to be through your plant palette, but also in how you um, design your, your, your land and do earthworks, and we're going to get into some of that green infrastructure. And then, of course, you can promote and provide pollinator habitat. This is a huge one. Um, and if you build it, they will come. That, I'm realizing, is a movie reference that is pretty dated at this point, but I'm guessing that most of you know what I'm talking about. Um, but truly, if you build it, they will come. Uh, native pollinators and other wildlife find our native plants and our, our patches of habitat that we create. This is a little cartoon that I like to share. Um, I can't even remember where I came across it, but you can see you've got the, the dad there with the lawnmower cutting down his grass and then the next generation saying, dad, I think we, we need to have a talk about bees and flowers and look at that lovely habitat over on his side. Who wouldn't want that? Okay, so getting uh, more into design. So there's something called genius loci. Um, and if you haven't heard of that term, uh, it translates into spirit of place. So it's a location's distinctive atmosphere. This is something that is taught in design school, um, in landscape architecture school a lot because we, we're trying to, to capture that distinctive atmosphere. So like I said, I worked at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and she has this famous quote, wherever I go in America, I like it when the land speaks its own language in its own regional accent, Texas should look like Texas and we can say Colorado should look like Colorado. So um, that just captures it so well, I think. We have such unique ecosystems across the state. Why don't we celebrate um, what, what each area has to offer? So if we look at the design process, um, it can be kind of intimidating. People get intimidated by this. Um, but really, if, if you kind of break it down into bite-sized pieces, it's, it's hopefully more approachable. <clears throat> so 
When we're designing, we're planning and making decisions about something for a specific purpose. So we're designating the location of elements and we're creating this aesthetically pleasing space. Um, design very much is about aesthetics, but when we talk about native plants, then of course we're bringing in, you know, all of these other ecological values. Um, you know, we're we're uh, conserving water, we're keeping water on site, we're creating that habitat and making it a more rich space. So you get the design or the um, the curb appeal, the aesthetic piece, but you also get that ecological value. So again, we're we're looking at how we create our outdoor spaces. So we're going to look at plant. I'm just going to remind everybody one more time, if you will mute yourselves. Thank you. Um, so we're looking at plant choices. What is our plant palette? We're looking at any hardscape. So maybe we have patios or pavers or sidewalks. Uh, and then irrigation. Even though we're talking about native plants, some people are going to have an irrigation system. Uh, and here in the arid west, that's okay. You just want to make sure that it's uh, installed correctly and it's maintained correctly. That's it. Oops, I'm sorry. I don't know how long I was muted. Well, anyway, um, just in the chat, can I don't know how I got muted. Can somebody tell me if I said, if you all heard me talking about plant choices and hardscape? Actually, Darren, I and I muted you just for a second. So I think oh. you got through most <laughs> your point. Okay. I was going through the participants and making sure that they were muted. So Oh, thank you, Kurt. I appreciate that. Okay. okay and I, I got you by mistake. So. Okay. No worries. Um, okay. So it's really important to, I think, understand this design process, whether you're doing it yourself or you're hiring a professional. So obviously, if you're doing it yourself, um, you know, it's it's great to have the, the structure and kind of understand um, the approach. But if you're hiring somebody, it's also really key to understand all these pieces because it's going to help you have a better conversation with the person, with the designer. You're going to be on the same page more quickly, and it's just you're probably going to have a more successful outcome. So, um, you know, some people do the whole things them themselves. Some people hire professional for parts of it. Um, but understanding these pieces is important no matter what. Uh, okay, so design is very much something that can be taught. Some people are certainly more artistic than others, but it can be taught and it can be learned. People get a bit intimidated. They think, oh my gosh, I don't have an artistic bone in my body. Um, I can't do this, but not true. Um, you know, if I look back at my at graduate school, um, people getting masters of landscape architecture come from all different backgrounds. Um, some people actually had degrees in fine art. Uh, I came at it from the horticulture side. There were computer programmers. There are all kinds of people that come to it. Uh, the key is getting the tools and strategies to be successful and remembering that you're working with dynamic systems. So that's really important. So this is different than other static art forms, right? We're working with plants that grow, plants that die, plants that, you know, change over time. So you have to remember that there's that fluidity with landscape um, design. Uh, now, when I worked at the Wildflower Center, um, I, I ran the volunteer crew down there. Um, and I had one uh, volunteer who had been there for years and years. And he would always give us a little pep talk sort of at the beginning of the season. And he would remind us that gardening is the slowest of the performing arts and to have patience. And I just love that. It's so, it's so right. You know, like things are just now waking up. So we're going to have this spring flush soon and uh, things are going to evolve throughout the summer, but then next year things are going to be totally different. So this design that we may have created is going to continue to change. So we want to systematically consider all aspects of the land, the environment. I already mentioned the growing and changing plants. Who are the users? That's super important. And then the ecology of the site. So you really have to, you can think about it um, as you're looking at it through different lenses 
or different hats. So you've got to put on your designer hat, ecologist hat, horticulturist, entomologist, and your homeowner hat at all different times and, and approach your design in your yard that way. So looking for inspiration is really important. Um, you need to know what you like and what you don't like. So just because you're working with native plants doesn't mean it's it has to or that it's going to look a particular way. Um, so I think it's important to get that inspiration. So whether you're looking online or you have books and magazines, I think very often people see somebody else's yard and they think, ooh, I like that. I want that in my yard. So <clears throat> figure out what you like. Again, if you're working with somebody else on this, then, then it's really important. You have to know what you like so that you can match um, their style, you know, whatever their kind of portfolio style is with what you want. You want to write down what your goals and objectives. So what style are you going for? Do you need outdoor play space? Do you want a tranquil sitting area? Are you creating that habitat? Um, you know, maybe you have pets or dogs, uh, I mean, or, <laughs> or children is what I meant to say. Um, you know, so you have to consider all of those users. Next step is doing a site inventory and analysis. And that is taking into consideration the existing environmental conditions. Um, you have to know what you have before you can change anything. And then you take the elements and principles of design and I'm, we're gonna be going through all of that. And then you create your design. So boom, easy, right? Well, it is a lot of steps um, and we're gonna walk through all of them and, and how to approach them. But before we do that, we're gonna just briefly go through the history of design. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you're taking a college course in this, you would have a whole semester or two about uh, the history of design. Um, but we can just look really briefly here. We have, um, there's evidence of landscape design that goes really, really far back. Um, the picture on the upper right is a depiction of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, if you've heard of that. Um, it's obviously an illustration. We don't have any actual record, but um, those are green roofs and living walls and things that we see today. The image on the bottom left, that was found in ancient Egypt. And if you look closely at it, what you have there is a pond in the middle um, with um, kind of a border around it and then fruit trees planted. And we can see that they're dates, um, palm dates, pomegranate and olive trees. And so that is very intentional and it's not agriculture, um, though they certainly were, you know, likely using the, the food crops. But it is very much this landscape design around that um, rectangular pond. And then, of course, you've got the Taj Mahal on the bottom right there. Super famous building. Everybody looks at the architecture um, and, you know, is in awe of it for good reason. But if you look at the, the landscape, it was also very intentional and very much a part of it. So there's that long reflecting pool um, leading up to it very intentional again reflecting that architecture and then the um the trees that that line that, that that flank that and the walkways so again all very intentional all very designed chinese and japanese um, cultures have very strong design history uh you're probably familiar with some of it it looks similar particularly the architecture but they're actually quite different. And so again, if, if you know what the differences are, um, then you can start to see it. And that's one thing actually that um, just really amazed me going through landscape architecture school is just how differently I look at the world now. You know, it's one of those, the more you know, or ignorance is bliss, or I don't know <laughs> which one, but I'm like, oh, I, you know, a person could walk through life, their whole life, not seeing these subtleties um, that are actually very, very intentional. So a few examples of that. Um, on the left is a Chinese uh, garden and on the right is Japanese. So Chinese landscape design 
and garden design is meant to be viewed from inside the garden. So it's designed for the user to be inside the garden, whereas Japanese is designed to be viewed from inside the home and looking into the garden. In Chinese design, there's almost always a water element. So it's a little hard to tell, but um, to the bottom left of the pink flowers, um, that is a pond, it's a waterway or a water area. In Japanese, design, water is represented, but it's not always present. Um, it's often in those Zen gardens where you see the wavy patterns raked in, that's meant to represent water. And then in Chinese design, stones are often placed on pedestals and, up, and sort of up high and grandiose to represent mountains. Japanese design also uses stones, but they're they tend to be in more natural groupings and a little more subtle. Finally, plant material in Chinese design is uh, tends to be left a little more natural. And in Japanese design, if you think about bonsai, yeah. it's very, very manicured, right? It's like clipped to within an inch of its life kind of thing. Um, so very different. Again, look similar, but you can see those intentions behind the design are so different. Then if we're, we're sort of like moving through history, if we look at Renaissance plantings, um, wow, look at that, you know, Gardens of Versailles, like talk about designed. Um, this is right when um, people were really like, like mastering nature, they're starting to put animals in cages and um, doing this to boxwoods and plants, you know, there's absolutely nothing that look, looks natural about that, but it was the style of the time. So then if we zip through, we've got the 1700s, 1800s. Um, we get up into the early 1900s, and I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of the arts and crafts architectural uh, era. There's also an arts and crafts landscape design era that went uh, with it. So again, a lot of this isn't known to most people, but when you really start to dive into landscape design and landscape architecture, you learn all of this. So then if we zip up to present day, um, <clears throat> excuse me, starting in about the, the, well, the 80s and 90s, we start getting this more naturalistic planting design. Um, certainly in the West, people are looking at being more water wise and xeriscape um, is introduced and we'll talk more about that. So we have all these styles, Chinese, English cottage style, Italian, Greek, all of these different ones. And this is the kind of thing that you want to kind of decide what you like. Um, probably if you're a native plant enthusiast and you're going to be incorporating native plants into a design, you're probably not gonna go for something like on the bottom left there. However, if your aesthetic, if that's what your aesthetic is, you like really clean lines, um, you can accomplish that with native plants. It's not gonna look exactly like that. Uh, and you're probably gonna have more species that are blooming. Um, but the point is, it doesn't have to look a certain way just because you're working with native plants. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the principles and elements of design. All three of these examples are very, very different, but they all have these certain um, components of design. We're gonna walk through those now. Um, they are the fundamental concepts of composition. So whether you're taking a photograph, drawing a drawing, painting a picture, or doing a landscape design, we have principles, which are guidelines that we okay. use to arrange things order, unity, proportion, and repetition. And then elements are arranged according to those design principles. And we're gonna walk through all of those. So first one being um, order. Humans prefer order. It makes us feel calm. It makes us feel in control. Um, you know, certainly some of us are messier than others, but generally speaking, people prefer order and it's achieved through balance. So if you see that image and the red line across the middle there um, and look at the top and look at the bottom, those are, <clears throat> excuse me, that design is balanced because it's a mirror image for the most part, it's a mirror image. So you've got the same 
elements on top that you do on the bottom. So that's one way to achieve order. Another, you can see the footprint of the house is the same and there's the, the turf, the green square. But if we look at that same axis, um, we no longer have a mirrored image, but it's still there's still order in that design because it is balanced. So you have more big things on the top and more small things on the bottom, and that kind of balances it out. And I will say, as I'm walking through this, it's not necessarily something that you're going to, you know, if you're walking through a botanic garden or a park or someone else's yard that's been designed, you're not necessarily going to say, oh, yes, really good order or, oh, here I see the unity. It's more of a feel when you're in the space. It just feels good. Um, so unity, link elements and features, it creates harmony, harmony and consistency. And often it's accomplished um, through using a focal point. So that image there is just a little you know, small vignette of someone's garden. Um, but that little bamboo um, divider there and then the, the succulent, those are focal points. And that brings unity to that little space. Next, we have scale and proportion. So in landscape design, we're, we're designing for human scale. And this means this is an object size relative to another object. So you can see in that line drawing there, um, you've got the little family under the pergola. Um, you've got plants at the ground level, sort of knee high. And then it just sort of builds up into that taller tree canopy. So that is very much built at the human scale. Then you have something like this. This the scale and proportion of this is pretty off um, for a space that feels good to be in. Um, it's a large house. It's stone. You have a few different kinds of stone and brick there. So it's very heavy, very monolithic. And then you've got those short little um, foundation shrubs that are really short. And yes, there are a few taller trees, but there's just... There's nothing in the middle and it just doesn't feel um, like a really comfortable space to be in. Um, and that's because the scale is off. Here is another example. Um, if we were in person, I would say, how's the scale and proportion on this one? Um, and I share this example because everything is either really, really short. You've got the little, um, you know, paper, uh, like log edging. Um, and tiny little plants, or you have those palm trees that are shooting up into the sky. Again, nothing in between. So you want to try to find that middle ground. Next, we have repetition. Repetition provides rhythm and a sequence to the space. So you can see different elements that are repeated here. You've got the actual stone stairs way over on the right that you can barely see. Um, and then that is repeated with the terraced beds. You have materials that are repeated with the boulders on each level and the steel um, edging on those, on those um, planting beds. So again, it, it's providing that rhythm to the space. Okay. So those are the principles. Now, if we move to the elements, um, these are visual descriptors of features within the design, within the space. So we have line, form, texture, color, smell, and sound. Again, we're going to walk through all of these. And looking at this picture here, this is outside of Fort Collins. Um, and again, it's just sort of a little snapshot of a larger landscape design. But this has all of those elements. And we'll walk through those. So line is a really, it's a simple one, but it's a really kind of powerful one. It directs our eye through the space. So if you look at the that gravel path taking you around to the right, my eye is very much drawn around there. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking, oh, what is around the corner? I wonder, you know, and it's because of that strong line. So you have it repeated with the the 
stone wall on the left and then that strip of turf on the right. So you've got all of these lines that are curving around to the right. Uh, Botanic garden design um, is very, very intentional and it, it is meant to move the, the visitors through the space. Um, and very often it uses things like line. This image, um, I think, you know, my eye is immediately drawn to that sitting area and the fireplace. And it's like, oh, okay, yes, what a nice sitting area. But then if you look over to the left uh, and you follow those stone pavers through the turf, you see, oh, there's a fountain and there's a hammock back there. And isn't that kind of a nice, quiet, tranquil area? And I think that if those stone pavers, if that line was not there directing your eye back there, it would it would get lost. It would be noticed much less. Next, we have form, and this is the skeleton of a space. So this is the bones. You can see this uh, example is a rectangular back garden, backyard, but they've brought in these very organic curvilinear lines and totally change the feel of it. You know, a lot of people would just say, oh, I've got this rectangular backyard and that's what I got and that's what I have to work with. But you can very much change uh, the, the space, how you move through it, how it feels with form and bringing in those different stru uh, structures. You can also do it with plant material, right? Especially with trees that have those very strong structural shapes. Next is texture. So this is how coarse or fine a surface is. And this is going to pro uh, provide variety and interest just through venation, just through, you know, again, that plant material, you're going to get different texture. Uh, here's an example of a space that has lots of different textures. You've got the, on the right, the wood slat bench. And you've got different stone materials, the wall, there, the, there's two different walls and then the pavers on the floor. Um, it's kind of a lot. There's, there's sort of a lot going on here and you would not want more textures than what you see there uh, because it just, it kind of becomes overwhelming and just starts to look chaotic. Uh, but one thing that is working here is the wood is repeated in that fence, the extension on the wall and the bench, and then the, um, the wall, even though it's different material, it's similar color. So again, it provides that rhythm and sequence through that repetition. Next is color, and color, of course, is very fun. Um, whether you're shopping for natives or other plants, you know, a lot of people see blooming things and they think, oh, pretty, I, I love that flower color, I want that. Uh, so, you know, we're going to talk about how to choose what plants to combine uh, a little later, but color is fun and it affects spatial perception. It affects light quality and balance. It can even affect uh, emotion. There's a study done, I think, in the 70s um, <clears throat> that showed that most family fights happened in the kitchen. And during that era, whenever the study was done, most kitchens were yellow. Um, so just, you know, there, perhaps there's a correlation there between the, um, the emotions and the, the charged color of the, of the space. Uh, warm colors are exciting. They're perceived as being closer and making us, they can make a space feel smaller. And then cool colors are calming and they're perceived as being farther away. So you can make a space feel larger. So you can work with that. If you have a really big space, and it feels kind of vacuous and it's like, I don't know what to do with all this space. You can make it feel a little more intimate um, with, with warmer colors. And then same if you have a small space and you still want to have a lot, you know, good, good design going on in there, you can use cooler colors. So I'm going to do a little um, exercise. So I want everybody, if you will, to go to the chat and get ready to... Um, to respond in in the chat with my question here. So I'm going to put two shapes up on the screen. Um, again, if we were in person, you'd just be shouting it out, but we're going to try to do it through the chat. Um, so I'm going to put two shapes up on the screen, and I want you to tell me which one your eye is drawn to. 
Like just where does your eye go? Okay, ready? Is everybody there? We'll give it a try. So one, two, and you can say left or right, or you can say the color or whatever, but okay, here we go. Which one is your eye drawn to the most? Okay, so I'm seeing both, but I'm overwhelmingly seeing red, the red one. Thanks everybody who chimed in. So the point of this is to show you that the red one is smaller than the blue one, yet it was still more eye-catching. If we make them the same size, then you can see, you can see that spatial perception. The red to me looks like it's leaping off the screen and the blue is just sort of kind of quietly sitting there. So just a little example to kind of show you what I was talking about and how you can play with colors in that way. Okay, so color theory, again, is a whole class in and of itself, um, and you can really go down some fun rabbit holes with color, um, but we're going to talk about three of the most basic um, strategies that people use with color in landscape design, and that first one is using monochromatic, a monochromatic palette, so that's one color, um, so you're using dark, medium, and light values of the same color. So you can see green there. So if you look at this image, again, if you feel so inclined, hop into the chat and you can answer this question. Um, this is a monochromatic plant palette, but to my eye, it works. Like I can see a lot going on. Does anybody know why that works so well? Yep, exactly. Texture. Some people chimed in. So there are so many different textures, different leaf shapes and sizes, and it's providing that variety. Yeah, I think you all got it. Thank you. So even though, you know, there's just a handful of different shades of green there, um, it's very dynamic and it's, it's, I think it's really pretty. So again, that's because we incorporated another element and that is texture along with that, um, that monochromatic color. Okay, next is analogous. So this is three to five colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. We don't see this very often. Um, <clears throat> you know, where you see it the most, I think is like on, you know, those like, um, oh, I don't know, like university plantings, they'll have, you know, they'll spell out something or this one here, these are all marigolds. You've got orange and then darker orange marigolds and then some red coleus and a hosta in the middle. Um, again, you don't see it that often, but people do use analogous. But then by far the most common is complementary. Um, and so that's colors that are opposite on the color wheel, red and orange, I'm sorry, uh, blue and orange, red and green, kind of purple and yellow. And that doesn't mean you know, I'm not saying that if you're going to do complementary colors, then you're only going to have purple and yellow flowers or orange and blue flowers. You're going to have a combination of those, but you're you're going to, um, as you're planting and choosing where things go, you're going to take those into consideration. So here's another, <laughs> excuse me, um, example. Again, people can chime in if you want. Um, <clears throat> here we have colors on opposite sides of the color wheel. You've got that bright pop of yellow, and then you've got the kind of lavendery purple color. Um, I, I think that's very pretty. It's it's a sweet little planting. Um, I guess I don't actually have anything for you to comment on, but uh, now I'm going to show you um, very similar color palette. You got the pop of yellow on the left, and you've got the purple on the right but it's a very different look. And the, the splash of orange in the back does not hurt at all. It, it definitely helps the overall composition. But even if you cover that up with your hand and you're just seeing the purple and the yellow, um, to me, the one on the bottom right works better. So I guess if anybody has a comment, why, why does the one on the right work a little more? It's just like a little more interesting. The one on the left is pretty, the colors are pretty, but yes, again, different textures, exactly. 
Exactly. And so it's pretty simple. You know, you just, you look at your different flower and leaf shapes and sizes and compositions. You've got the spikes instead of all the same little kind of flower. So these are the kind of things that you can really play with and have a lot of fun with. So, okay. Thanks everybody who's, who's chiming in. Okay. So finally we've got smell and sound. Uh, these are great also to play with, uh, smell. Um, we have native plants that have nice smells. I use some non-natives that are very, have really strong smells, rose, lilac, jasmine. Um, but you know, smell can be really powerful. It can take you back in time. There's nostalgia with it. Um, so you can, you can have fun with that. And then sound, you could be something that you add to the garden, like, you know, wind chimes, something like that, but you can also do it with your plant selection. Our native uh, ornamental grasses, when they like switch grass and little blue stem, when they're blowing on a, you know, breezy day, have a nice rustling sound. Um, of course, if you live somewhere where you can have aspen, that has a really beautiful sound on a windy day. So again, just different aspects that you can play with, with those different elements. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick moment for questions. If anybody has questions and Maggie, I'm not sure how you wanna, I can try to look or if you've been tracking. Oh no, I've been things. tracking. Um, okay. Most of the chat are responses to your questions, but one question came up about like plant selection for that middle zone, the middle mm -hmm. height. Um, yeah. So what, what are your recommendations for that? When we're talking about the, the scale and proportion. Um, so we certainly have some um, shrubs that do well, you know, like uh, golden current or uh, um, uh, like Apache plume and those sorts of things. Those, the grasses, I think are really wonderful options. I'm just, I fall in and out of love with plants all the time. Sometimes they're my favorite, sometimes they're not. Right now I'm really, really loving um, our grasses, the switch grasses, alkali, sacatone, blue stem, little blue stem and big blue stem. So those are gonna give you a good variety of height too. Um, they also provide excellent structure. They provide great habitat. Um, <clears throat> so that's one thing, but we do have, <coughs> excuse me, a, a, a good variety of small to medium shrubs too. Um, and I'll, I'll get into some, a few plant lists a little more too. So good question. Any other questions? Otherwise I can just keep going. That was the only other question I noticed, except one was raised about the recording and we are recording. So um, we will publish that in due time, okay. probably about a week. <laughs> okay, thanks Maggie. So, excuse me, I know that the, the design part is a little bit like nuts and bolts and can be a little bit dense, but um, again, I think it's just really good to be at least introduced to those concepts. Um, because that's what goes into it. It's not just picking plants and popping them in the ground. So um, now we're going to talk about, so where can you do all of this? You can do it anywhere. Um, you might have a small little courtyard. You might have a huge estate. Um, it's always good to look for unusual spots. People are doing, you know, you can do it on patios and containers. You can definitely do native plants in containers. You can do them in your medium, medium strips. So I would say anywhere. But where do you start? So this is a tricky part. Um, this is where a lot of people kind of stall out. And that, so you want to start with your site analysis. You have to know what you're working with before, you know, you can really successfully do anything else. Because there's a chance um, that, you know, you might have things that are really great. You don't need to change that much, but you might just want to change certain areas. Um, so. I always recommend people sketching it out. There's something that happens between, you know, your brain and getting getting it out on paper that kind of loosens things up and, and lets ideas flow a little better. Um, so this is not drawing your, your final design. This is, you can see that image there. You, you get a rough estimate of where your house footprint is. And then you just draw circles. I got this big tree here. I've got these shrubs over here that 
they're dying anyway and I want to get rid of them or they're total water hogs and I'm going to dig them out and, you know, give them to somebody else or whatever. Um, look at your topography, where are your high spots and your low spots. That's going to really come into play if you're doing anything like a rain garden um, exposure, sun, sunny areas and shady areas. That, of course, is going to dictate where you might plant things or where you plant what plants. Understanding your soil type is hugely important. So I always suggest that people get soil tests done. Um, it's pretty quick, it's pretty easy, relatively inexpensive, about $35, $40. Um, and that's gonna tell you a lot. We, we talk a lot about right plant, right place. Um, and then, you know- I know, people, I know, I know. And then we say, um, you know, well, if it's a native plant, then it's going to be able to handle our soils. But some people live in places where we do not, they do not have native soil at all. Um, so understanding what you have below ground is super duper important. Um, so CSU Extension, um, the new C the new um, Spur campus that's in Denver, is there's a soil testing lab. There's Ward Labs, W-A-R-D, they're in Nebraska. Um, you can send your samples to them. There, you have a couple of different options, but understanding your soil is super important. Then finding microclimates, what happens on the south side of your house versus the north side. And then again, determining those use areas. So if you know um, that your dog always goes on the same path every time, draw that in. You know that. You probably don't want to put your favorite whatever perennials there because your dog is just gonna mow them down um, when we talk about pet friendly landscaping um, we always suggest that <clears throat> and design for, for pets uh, we always say don't try to break their habits you know work around them if you can uh, very often people think, oh, well, I'm going to just put something here and then the dog won't go there. Well, oftentimes they still just do. So, you know, um, you kind of, if you can work with what you have, that's great. Um, so again, put pencil to paper. Um, it's going to save you time. It's going to save you money. You want to create functional diagrams and that's circulation and uses. So again, you can see this. Um, this one is site analysis. This is showing, I've got these shrubs here, these trees here, this is where my patio is. This one is saying, okay, I want an open space, open play area here. I want this to be planted. This is where we walk in the house. That's a functional diagram. And again, you wanna create these different, um, different iterations of designs once you actually start to create designs. Uh, change it up. You know, You might have this perennial bed over here try putting it in a totally different place. That's the time to, or it's a really good time to try out different things before you invest the time and the sweat and blood and tears and all of that in, in getting it all installed. So your final design will create those hardscapes and materials, any planting areas, what plants you're actually going to install, and then if you're gonna do any irrigation. Um, I like to show this as an example of, again, why, you know, whether we're talking about people or pets or whatever, we've all seen this sort of thing. Um, you know, the designer is like, oh, the people will walk on this path because that is where I have designed it to be. But people are going to go where they want to go. And clearly they saw this big shortcut they could take. And that's what you get. So Again, you want to take that sort of thing into consideration. You might think, oh, this looks good if I have this sweeping area over here. But in reality, when I go to take out the trash can, it's a lot easier to just whatever, take this other route. So you want to think through all those things. Um, I have a friend uh, down in Austin who she, there was a, a sort of a weird diagonal path that was cut through her front yard. Uh, and she could not figure out what it was from. And she was home one day in the middle of the day and she saw that the mail person walked that path every day and cut a path in there. Um, at first she was annoyed. And then when she went to, to um, redo her front yard, she actually incorporated that in and created a little gravel pathway for the mail carrier 
who was, you know, delighted. They bonded over it. It was lovely. Um, but she decided, you know what, let's just, let's just build that in. The, a mail carrier is going to continue to come every single day, you know, so let's just build that in. Here's another example of that. Um, this is Montana State University campus. And you can see, as you look down, there's some pretty odd uh, angles and curves and things in those sidewalks. And that is because they were getting all of these little, you know, some people call them cow trails or, but they were student and faculty trails through the turf. So they were planning on redoing this area and the landscape architects after snowstorms, after, you know, a handful of snowstorms actually got up on the rooftops of those buildings and watched where people walked when there were no designated paths. And each time they were in almost exactly the same spot. So they decided, you know what, let's go with it. Let's put these paths where people are gonna walk anyway, cause that's where they're gonna walk, whether we have sidewalks there or not. And it eliminated those cut across and those cow paths. So again, people and animals were creatures of habit. We're gonna go, you know, easiest point from A to B. So take that into consideration with your circular, with your, um, your design. Okay, so what garden styles are appropriate in Colorado? So again, you know, we've got that English cottage, we've got Chinese, Japanese, whatever. Um, but there are some there are some styles that we tend to lean toward here, and especially more and more. So we've got xeriscaping, rock gardens are very popular, people are creating wildlife habitat, rain gardens are really excellent, and then Colorado scape is a term that people are starting to uh, experiment with. It's sort of different than Xeriscape. Um, so I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but you might start hearing about that more. Um, but I'm gonna go through Xeriscape just a little bit. Um, so this is water-wise design. It was coined, the term was coined in the 1980s by Denver Water when they realized how much of their uh, water users were putting, or how much water their customers were putting on the landscape and they thought, oh, we need to do something about this. Let's introduce Xeriscape. <laughs> um, and people are doing it today still. There's still a lot of confusion around it, but there are seven steps to this. You plan for water conservation, you improve or you at least pay attention to the soil. You look at your turf areas, irrigation. Step five, you select appropriate plants. That is where natives come into play. Natives are excellent. For xeriscapes, you look at mulch and you look at what your maintenance is gonna be. Now, when I said there's still a lot of uh, confusion around xeriscape, it's xeriscape, meaning xeric, dry, and not zero scaping. I know this image here is not a Colorado landscape, but this is what people think of when they think of xeriscaping. When in fact, we've got lots of options. Um, these are all xeric landscapes. All look a little different, but they all have mo most, if not all of those seven um, steps taken into account. And I also wanna point out, um, you know, not knowing what everybody's level of knowledge and background is, a lot of people, even if they're on board with Xeriscape and they understand it pretty well, they still think that it's going to be sparsely planted, but that's not the case. So this example here, this is not all natives, there are some natives, um, but it's it's pretty full, you can see. So Xeriscape or water-wise landscaping or native plant landscaping does not mean not many plants. You're still going to plant at approximately the same plant density as a traditional or conventional landscape, it's just about your plant palette and, and planning for that water conservation. So um, here's the water-wise garden in Denver, just popping with color. Uh, a couple more examples. Rock gardens are quite popular. Again, just a few little inspirations. We got native, native gardens, pollinator gardens, all kinds of options. And again, just going through those, they all look kind of similar, but you know, they also had their, their own kind of aesthetic appeal. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna get into a bit of the, the green infrastructure and the, the rainwater harvesting aspect of um, how to garden with, or, or how to design. Um, and this, you can really do a lot with um, 
earthworks, we call it, basically um, how we um, how we move our land, our, our soil around to, to keep water on site. So active rainwater harvesting is where you capture rainwater in a container to hold it for later use. So that's, you could think of that as tank storage or rain barrel storage. Um, and that of course is what was illegal until 2016, I think, law was passed that we can now um, re collect rainwater off of our roofs and into barrels. Um, but then there's also passive rainwater harvesting, and that's where you divert water overland to vegetated areas for immediate use. And you can think of that as soil storage. So a lot of people think, well, if it's raining right now, then, you know, what do you mean for immediate use? Uh, a lot of our landscapes, if not designed correctly, we can get a, a really good rain but a lot of that rain just runs right off our landscapes. It sort of sheet flows away and into the storm gutters and away it goes. Um, but we can design our spaces so that the water really infiltrates and percolates down into the soil. People don't realize how much of it actually runs off. So you, ha you have to kind of be intentional in how you capture that water. And then you get it into the soil and it goes deep and it's just so good for, for um, it cleans the water and it helps the plants. So passive rainwater harvesting, uh, the term green infrastructure is um, often that's kind of more of an industry term, but uh, it can also be applied to residential areas. Uh, and the key is we're wanting to slow the water, spread the water and sink the water. So this can be integrated into your landscape through swales, berms, French drains, and rain gardens. So to start out with this, you have to figure out what kind of passive harvesting techniques are right for you. And so you create these flow maps. Um, ideally, this is some of what you've done with your site analysis. You're finding your high spots and your low spots. Uh, you're seeing where water flows on and off your site. Again, you've got your site analysis map and you already know, oh, I've got high spots and low spots and maybe I could capture some water over here. So the first one we're looking at is uh, our swales. So swales spread, again, we wanna slow spread or sink the water. Swales spread the water horizontally. So you can see that, that gravel uh, channel, that's a swale moving the water from one area to another. Uh, some people call them dry creek beds, and a lot of people just have these little dry creek beds in their yards as part of the design, but they're totally not functional. Uh, but if you imagine that at the back of this little dry creek bed is a downspout coming off a, a gutter, then it can be activated when it is actually raining, and it can carry that water to a, a place where you actually want it. So it can be aesthetically pleasing, and then it can also... Um, activate and be functional. You do want to be careful about where you direct the water. So this image here up over on the right, there's that little tree and <clears throat> you can see those rocks. There's a little swale that kind of does a little switch back from where they're capturing water to just behind that tree. So they're trying to sink that um, water into the tree. That's a tricky sloped landscape uh, or yard. So you do have to be careful that you're not directing water, you know, into your neighbor's yard and causing trouble for them. You, you need to be really intentional with, with where you direct that, but you can really move a lot of water with swales. Then we have berms. Um, so this is a raised area designed to slow water down. So there's a transition between the existing grade and the berm. And you want that slope to be nice and gradual. So you don't want what we see up on the top. You want it to be um, nice and, and gradual. If it's if you if your berm looks like a speed bump, like the one on the top, um, as water moves in, it starts to undercut that berm. And then it just really, it sort of uh, de degrades and, and won't work so well. So ideally, it's not going to look like you have speed bumps all over your yard. They're going to be gradual, they're going to be planted, and they just sort of blend in. Then we've got French drains. So a lot of people know of French drains as 
um, you know, like if you have a problem area, maybe some foundation issues with, um, with flooding. And so you're wanting to move water away from a space, but you can also do it as a landscape feature, as a passive water harvesting technique. And that is for those who might not be familiar with a French drain. Um, if you look at the image on the uh, top there, water collects on the roof, it goes into the gutter, into the downspout, and then that um, the dotted lines show that the downspout connects to a pipe, usually a PVC pipe that goes underground. And if you look at the bottom image, that's a sort of a cross section, that pipe goes underground. And then the pipe has holes and the water is released where you want it to release. So again, you can do that out in your yard wherever it makes sense for your design. And then we have rain gardens. So rain gardens are, um, Rain gardens are just fantastic. They do so much. They're modeled um, after um, natural systems. They are a depressed area. This one um, in the, the uh, surrounded by the turf area there, that's a really big one in a common area of sort of a commercial, you know, uh, condos and those sorts of things. So that's an example of a large one that could really um, take on a lot of water, but you can have smaller versions of those in your home yard and they're fully planted um, and, um, you know, they don't necessarily look like sunken areas like that. This is an example of a rain garden at New Belgium Brewery in Fort Collins. So this is great because you can see um, it's coming off of a parking lot. And so as water moves across a parking lot or even a driveway, it picks up all kinds of pollutants and nasty stuff. And that, you know, if you don't have something like a rain garden and it just goes into the storm system, it's not going to get cleaned well. Um, and then that water makes it into lakes and streams. But if it can make its way into an area like this, you can't even tell that it has any function, but it's a rain garden. As the water moves through, the rocks and the plant roots and the mulch and the microbes, the water is actually cleaned as it moves down into the groundwater. So really highly functional and really excellent. Um, again, they're modeled after natural ecosystems. They keep that water on site and can clean it, protects their local streams and lakes, replenishes groundwater supplies, um, and the list goes on and on. Rain gardens are just super great. If you're gonna create a rain garden, there are some rules of thumb that you wanna follow. Uh, you wanna locate them in an area where the rainwater naturally occurs. So, you know, you might have a lovely spot that you can see from your kitchen window and you think, oh, that would be a great spot for a rain garden. But if it's a high spot, it's gonna be impossible and you're just gonna have to dig way deeper and constantly be fighting the grade of the ground. So you wanna plan your garden like a river flows and follow the path of least resistance. So um, looking at your downspouts, your driveways or sidewalks and seeing where that water flows already and then creating that, um, that rain garden there. You do want to keep them at least 10 feet away from buildings. You don't want to cause any issues with your foundation. Um, and you need to keep them away from septic tanks and water wells too. You don't want to mess with that. But you can see um, the image there on the bottom. So if you're looking at the house and then there's that blue squig squiggly line, there's a, a French drain that go comes over to this rain garden and empties out into the rain garden and just dumps all of that water um, and and lets it infiltrate and then waters those plants that are there. Um, sometimes people say, you know, I had that example of the swale that dumped right behind the tree and people think, oh, could I do a rain garden by a tree to get more water to my tree? It's pretty tricky, especially if it's at all mature because you can't, you have to dig out a depression and you don't want to dig around those tree roots because you're probably going to do more harm than good. So um, you have to kind of weigh, weigh your options there, but it can be fully planted and just look kind of like a normal garden, um, but actually have that function going on. And that is what I think is so cool, especially um, if you're working and gardening and designing with native plants, is that you're, you're bringing that ecological value to your site. 